the June of 2009 drew the attention of the world media to Tehran, which saw an unprecedented public protest post the declaration of results of the presidential elections. Meanwhile, far away from Tehran, one of the Iran's nuclear fuel enrichment facilities at Natang was hit by what was about to be termed as the world's deadliest cyber weapon, Stuxnet. Iran has been aspiring to become the regional hegemon in the Middle East. Its nuclear programs are suspected to be aimed at enriching uranium to develop nuclear weapons. Stuxnet blew several nuclear centrifuges at Natang. Without firing a single bullet, the cyber weapon was able to slow down Iran's nuclear projects by at least two years. The process of nuclear fuel enrichment involves rotation of impure fuel in the centrifuges that rotate at a precise speed. It is reportedly believed that Stuxnet destroyed a fifth of Iran's nuclear centrifuges by causing them to spin out of control. It did not allow manual shutting down of centrifuges once it hit its targets. Even if we overlook the fact that Stuxnet uses several zero-day vulnerabilities and two stolen certificates, the fact that it targeted the Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities makes one to believe that it was an attack sponsored by nation states. Neither Israel nor the US have made any comments on the question of who was behind Stuxnet so far. According to Fred Kaplan, an American author and journalist, Stuxnet was developed as a part of Operation Olympic Games by the NSA. According to one of his books, Dark Territory, The Secret History of Cyber War, it was a joint effort by the NSA, CIA, and Israel Cyber Warfare Bureau. Stuxnet might have entered the Natang nuclear facility through an infected USB flash drive. Also, it should be noted that the developers of Stuxnet relied on the supply chain attack to get to its target. A supply chain attack is an attack where the attackers target vulnerable units in the supply chain of its target. Four computer companies near Natang were targeted first. The contractors who might have used computers that came out of these outlets might have as well infected the system inside Natang. It is believed that some earlier versions of Stuxnet were present in the cyberspace much before Stuxnet was first discovered. The Iranian administration suspected that the spikes and dips in the voltage could have damaged the spinning centrifuges. The power suppliers were from Turkey. Iran, suspecting a sabotage, turned to other suppliers. Stuxnet was first discovered in June 2010. It was found lurking in power plants, traffic control systems, and factories across the world. Stuxnet is 20 times more complex than any malware known so far. With an array of capabilities, it can be used to shut down nuclear reactors or oil pipelines and tell the system that everything was alright. It does not use forged security clearance, rather it fares forward with the stolen security clearance certificates. It uses four zero-day vulnerabilities, unlike other malwares, Stuxnet has a specific target. The rest of the video talks about the technical specification of Stuxnet and we also present the forensic analysis of a virtual memory image of Stuxnet taken from an infected machine using volatility. Let's talk about the technical overview of Stuxnet. Here we will discuss how the malware propagated through the machines and affected its target. We have divided the overview into several stages. The first stage is infection. Here the Stuxnet enters the system through removable flash drive and starts infecting all Microsoft Windows machines. Stuxnet used a stolen digital certificate to bypass detection systems. The second stage is search. On every infected machine, Stuxnet checks whether it is the machine that is a part of targeted industrial control system or not. If it is not, then the Stuxnet does nothing but propagating and infecting the other computers over the network till it reaches the target machine. 
The third stage is update. If the system is a target machine, then the worm attempts to access the internet and download a more recent version by communicating with command and control server of the attacker. Fourth stage is compromise. The worm then compromises the target system's logical controllers, exploiting zero-day vulnerabilities. Here. Zero day vulnerabilities means the software weaknesses that haven't been identified by security experts till they are exploited. Stuxnet also replaces the original files with its own files. Fifth stage is control. After compromising the system, Stuxnet spies on the operations of the targeted system. Then it uses the information and data it has gathered to take control of the centrifuges, making them spin themselves to failure. Sixth and final stage is deceive and destroy. After taking control of the centrifuges, Stuxnet provides false feedback to the outside Siemens Step 7 software ensuring that the operators won't know what's wrong until it's too late to do anything about it. Thus, it successfully destroys the target. By now, you might have had the basic idea of Stuxnet. To let you know why the Stuxnet is so sophisticated, I'm gonna talk in more detail about it. First, let us look at the organization of the Stuxnet in the picture. The outer layer is a wrapper program that acts as a dropper component. It contains all of the components of Stuxnet malware inside a section called Stub section. The components include one large dynamic link library file and two encrypted configuration blocks. The encrypted configuration blocks contains the configuration data of the thread like the flags, set, and etc. The large DLL file is the heart of the Stuxnet malware that contains all of the code to control the worm. The large DLL file in turn has two more components called exports and resources. Exports are used for controlling the worm. They can be assumed as function calls. Every export has different purpose in controlling the threat. In the DLL exports table, we can see export 16 is called for the main installation of the Stuxnet malware on the compromised computer. Export 4 is used for calling the removal routine which in turn calls the export 18 which is used for uninstalling the Stuxnet whenever it is required. Resources are used by the exports in the course of controlling the worm. This can be assumed as called functions which perform the action required. In the DLL resources table, we can see resource 222 is used for exploiting print spooler vulnerability and resource 242 is used for loading the MRX NetSys rootkit driver. Few important concepts that we need to know beforehand. They are uh, one process injection. Process or DLL injection is a technique used for running code, mostly malicious code, within the address space of another process which is legitimate by forcing it to load a dynamic link library. Second, API hooking. API hooking is a technique by which we can instrument and modify the behavior and flow of API calls. The third, rootkit. It is a collection of computer software which is malicious, designed to gain the root access and often to hide its existence. Let us look into more details of each stage of the attack. Stage 1. Infection Stuxnet enters the system that is Natang facility through the removable drive. It bypasses the behavioral blocking of the antivirus softwares by hooking itself to few functions in NTDLL dynamic linking library. If in any case the threat is unable to bypass the antivirus softwares, it stops spreading and immediately uninstalls itself using its exports and resources so that it is not detected by any kind of intrusion detection system before reaching the target. Stuxnet also exploits two zero-day windows vulnerabilities to gain the admin right. The vulnerabilities being used are Windows Local Privilege Escalation Vulnerability and Task Scheduler Vulnerability. Stuxnet was able to gain root access and hide its files because of Windows Rootkit, that is MRXnet.sys. The computer assumed that the rootkit driver file is legitimate and allowed it to execute because the driver was digitally signed with legitimate Realtek digital certificates which were stolen by the attackers. Gaining root access. Stuxnet used 
process injection technique and hooks itself to processes like local security authority subsystem service and windows login subsystem service to gain root access hiding malicious files stuxnet creates registry entries to load the file mrxnet.sys as a service that will automatically run when the window starts driver scans for various file systems and manipulates them so that it can intercept irp requests like write read to devices ndfs fat or cd rom after getting hold of the file system the rootkit driver monitors directory control input output request packets especially the directory query notifications when the user program browses the files in the removable device directory the irp calls are manipulated by the rootkit driver in such a way that it filters all the stuxnet files on the device if you can see in the picture in the linux environment we can see all the files of the thread in the removable drive but when the removable drive is connected to the windows desktop the files of the thread are visible only for a fraction of seconds and then they disappear as you can see in the screenshots stage 2 search stuxnet continuously searches for the targeted machine that is the machine on which the siemens industrial control system software is installed it looks for the files with s7 and mcp extension which are generally located in siemens sematic step 7 software if the current system is not the targeted machine then stuxnet does nothing but spreading itself to the other computers in the network stuxnet propagates by copying itself over the network using variety of means they are a two zero day vulnerabilities printer spooler vulnerability and windows server service vulnerability b by infecting computers running wincc database server c through network shares and d through usb driver infections by exploiting both lnk vulnerability and autorun.inf file that allows auto execution of files on the removable drive as soon as it is connected stage 3 update once the targeted machine is found by the stuxnet it attempts to update itself with most recent version often the targeted machine that is the system having siemens step 7 industrial control software are in the field and do not have an internet access then how will the stuxnet update itself with the latest version generally in any industrial plants all the computers except the computer in the field are connected to each other on single network and the operators often exchange the data between the administrator or developer machines and the field machines using the removable usb drives firstly the stuxnet on the machine that has internet connectivity will update itself with the latest version by communicating with the command and control server of the attacker thereafter it updates the thread files on the other machines in the local area network using peer to peer update method the peer to peer component works by installing an rpc server and client on the compromised computer when the thread infects the computer it starts the rpc server and listens for connections any other compromised computer on the network can connect to the rpc server and ask what version of the thread is installed on the remote computer there are two cases possible case 1 if the remote version is newer than the local computer it will make a request for the new version and will update itself with that case 2 if the remote version is older than the local computer it will prepare a copy of itself and send it to the remote computer so that it can update itself actually stuxnet is a dll file it can create a on fly executable version of its own by using its template after updating the thread files on all the machines in the network stuxnet infects the usb drive and whenever the operator connects it to the targeted machine the thread on it gets updated thus the indirect communication channel between the target machine and the command and control server is established stage 4 compromising the control system project stuxnet triggers the infection of step 7 software files as soon as it finds the files with s7p and mcp extensions it hooks itself 
to the API calls that are used by computer to open the project files inside the step 7 process. It replaces one of the step 7 DLL file with that of its own version that is s 7 otbx dx.dll is replaced with s 7 otbx sx.dll and thus compromising the Siemens step 7 software on the Windows machine. In general, programmable logic controllers execute blocks of code and data in order to control and monitor the industrial process. Normally, s 7 otbx dxdll is responsible for handling PLC block exchange between computer running semantic manager on Windows and PLC which is in the field. But the Stuxnet takes control of the PLC by using its first ever PLC rootkit that is s 7 otbx sxdll It monitors PLC code blocks being written to and read from the PLC. It also infects a PLC by inserting its own code blocks and replacing or infecting existing blocks. It marks the fact that a PLC is being infected by intercepting the communication between PLC and Step 7 software and altering the response of the PLC with its own data and thus deceiving the operator that everything is normal. Stage 6 Deceive and Destroy Stuxnet deceives the operator and inserts modified STL code blocks into the Siemens PLC controllers which in turn regulates the motors used in centrifuges and other machinery. Stuxnet begins speeding and slowing the motors to try to damage or destroy the centrifuge and machinery. This is how Stuxnet takes control of the centrifuges making them spin themselves to failure. For the purpose of our forensic analysis, we downloaded a virtual memory image file for a machine infected by Stuxnet and uh, we are using volatility. So the way we do it is we first navigate to the volatility folder where I have kept the file that we downloaded and I'll quickly show you the files that I have here. So this is the stuxnet.vmem file which you can find on the internet. It is nearly 500 MB file. So the first net thing that you would like to do is to check if volatility can give you any more information about this virtual remote file by image info. So this command takes some time. This hyphen f is basically takes the file name. So what it tells is the profile is WinXP SP2 32-bit architecture. So by now we know is Textnet attacked machines that were running on Windows and uh, were having 32-bit architecture. And it was found in the dump was taken in 2011. So that's about one year after this Textnet was discovered. And if we go for PS list which is process list. We are looking for the processes that were running at the time the uh, dump was taken. So win log on process ID is 624 and LSAS process ID is 680 and its parent process ID is 624. So LSAS was started by win log on, which is perfectly fine behavior. But what about these two LSAS uh, instances? Well, they were started by 668 which is services.exe also noticed that these processes were started somewhere in 2010 but these LSAS were started in 2011. Now that is suspicious. So there's one more command which won't give any new information but just to show you if you have to look into some specific uh, processes you can use this the list can be longer than this so it's easier so it's the same information next what we may be interested in is is there any connection open was there any connection open at the time the dump was taken so for that we have this connections command well at that time there was no connection open so what about sockets? So 
This process is listing at port 500, which happens to be a legitimate port. But what about the other process IDs? The process IDs that we suspected, those are not here. Now, the next thing that we may be interested in is how many DLLs did this process load? So the legitimate process is 680 and WC is word count minus L is new lines. So we are counting the number of lines for this command. So in essence, we are counting the number of DLLs that were loaded. So 64, how many do we expect for 868? I think much less than 64 because it's a malicious process. Okay. And what about this? Okay. Still, what we might be interested in is uh, what about the unlinked DLLs, LDR modules for the process that we suspect to be malicious. So these are the unlinked DLLs. We can get to Barbos. A little more information on that. Okay. So okay. I just noticed this file name and this these four words they would keep coming, they would come again when we go for when we look into the API hooks. So why don't we look right now? Malfind. Malfind helps us to search the API hooks for any process if there are any. So this process has API hooks and you see this page execute rewrite. So this is basically and this is a blue map view of section and this file name again ls aslr. So what about the legitimate process? Do we expect any API hooks there? I don't think so. So uh, what we might be interested in is uh, there might be any previously unloaded drivers or drivers that have been hidden or unlinked by the rootkits. So for that, so we have a command called mod scan. So uh, if you look in this list, the first driver should draw your attention this file name. It's suspicious and uh, we copy this location and this is the file name because of which Stuxnet got its name. Uh, there's another file, stub, stub plus mrxnet is Stuxnet. So now we look into mod dump. And the way to do that is dir slash base address and shift insert. So, yes, there is a driver with this name. We copy it and we see if we can find the SHA hash for this. Shift insert. Here it is. We copy this and we check on the internet what the internet has to say about this. So, there is this virus total website on which you can check any file. Uh, now you see here, it says Stuxnet. And interestingly, if you search what Microsoft has to say for this, they are fine with it. It's 2016 and it's patched. So that's, that completes our analysis.